Let me begin by thanking the board and management of the Center for Global Development for this kind invitation to share some thoughts on a just and equitable uh, transition. I, I think the uh, central thinking to, for most developing countries is that we are confronted on this issue of a just transition uh, is that we're really confronted with two, not one uh, existential crisis. The climate crisis, of course, is the, the, the central issue, but also e extreme poverty. So for us, it's not just the climate crisis, there's also the crisis of, of, of extreme poverty in the developing world. The clear implication of this is, uh, is that our plans and commitments to carbon neutrality must include clear plans on energy access if we are to confront poverty. This includes access to energy for consumption and productive use, spanning across electricity, heating, cooking, and other end use sectors. But both the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the conflict in Ukraine have had severely damaging effects on decades worth of gains made in the energy sector in developing countries, particularly in the most vulnerable countries and those already lagging in energy access. Nearly 90 million people in Asia and Africa who have previously gained access to electricity can no longer afford to pay for their basic energy needs. The inflationary pressures caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and, all, and its after effects and other macroeconomic trends have been further exacerbated by the ongoing war in Ukraine. Countries worldwide have been hit by record high prices on all forms of energy. Power prices are breaking records across the globe, especially in countries or markets where natural gas plays a key role in the energy mix. So as the supply of gas from existing sources becomes restricted, developing countries using gas are forced to compete with the European countries who are scrambling to replace Russian energy with supply from other partners, and of course, this is driving up prices. This dynamic itself is compounded by the food and financial crisis also experienced by many countries as a result, again, of the war in Ukraine. But a subtext of the unfolding drama is the double standards evident in the response to the current energy crisis by many countries in the global north. Today, as I'm sure many of us know, uh, excluding South Africa, the remaining one billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa are serviced by uh, an installed capacity of just 81 gigawatts of power. Sub-Saharan Africa has contributed, again, you know, uh, information that's already out there, that one has contributed less than 1% of cumulative uh, CO2 emissions. By comparison, the United States has an installed capacity of 1,200 gigawatts of power a pop to a population of 331 million people, while the United Kingdom, for example, has 76 gigawatts of installed capacity for its 67 million people. The per, capita, the per capita energy capacity in the UK is almost 15 times that in Sub-Saharan Africa. But many of these countries had barely a year ago seriously advocated or implemented policies on limiting public funding for fossil, uh, for fossil fuel projects in developing countries, making no distinction between upstream oil and coal exploration and gas power plants for grid balancing. But today, in the wake of the energy crisis, many European nations have made recent announcements to increase or extend their use of coal-fired power yeah, for generating power through 2023 and potentially beyond. Of course, this is in violation of their climate commitments, and analysis suggests that this will raise power sector emissions of the EU by 4%, a significant amount, and that's you know, considerable given the high base denominator of EU emissions. But also worthy of note 
is that Europe's energy crisis has not been ignored. It continues to be met with support and international resources. In stark contrast, the developing world is still being held to account on its emission reduction without adequate support and investment for their energy transitions. The point being made is that the climate crisis and our commitments to resolve it would involve significant sacrifices from all and not just poorer countries. If the default position of the wealthier nations, once their energy comfort is threatened, is to resort to the dirtiest fuels, then we may be on a recursive path, one step forward, two steps backwards. Demand management or energy efficiency measures is the sensible option to meet the current challenges that face uh, our countries, not recommissioning old uh, coal-fired power plants. Another point to be made is that while Africa's current unmet energy needs are huge, future demand will be even greater due to expanding populations, urbanization, and movement into the middle class. It is clear that the continent must address its energy constraints and would require external support and a good measure of policy flexibility to deliver this. Unfortunately, in the wider responses to the climate crisis, we're not seeing careful consideration and acknowledgement of Africa's aspirations. For instance, despite the tremendous energy gaps, global policies are increasingly constraining Africa's energy technology choices. With the Kigali communique and several other formal and informal consultations, African nations are now happily more intentional in taking joint ownership of our transition pathways and designing climate-sensitive strategies that address our growth objectives. This is what Nigeria has done, especially with our energy transition plan. The plan itself, the Nigeria's energy transition plan, was designed to, take, to tackle the dual crisis of energy poverty and climate change and deliver SDG 7 by 2030 and net zero by 2060, while centering the provision of energy for development, industrialization, and economic growth. We anchored the plan on key objectives, including lifting 100 million people out of poverty in this decade, driving economic growth, bringing more modern energy services to the full population, and managing the expected long-term job losses in the oil sector due to global de uh, decarbonization. Given these objectives, the plan recognizes the role that natural gas must play in the short term, is short to medium term, to facilitate the establishment of baseload energy capacity and address the nation's clean cooking deficit in the form of LPG, which is why they are limiting public investments in gas projects as a critical energy transition pathway for Africa poses dire challenges for African nations and we believe violates the enshrined principles of equity and justice while making an insignificant dent in global emissions. Several countries, including the US, China, Japan, and uh, large parts of Asia and the EU still include gas as a major pillar of their multi-decadal uh, decarbonization strategies, including actively using African gas from countries like Mozambique, Ghana, Senegal, and Nigeria. In such a global reality, limiting financing of gas projects for domestic use would pose a severe challenge to the pace of economic development, delivery of electricity access, and clean cooking solutions and the scale-up and integration of renewable energy into the energy mix. Also, our energy transition plan finds that an additional 10 billion US dollars over business as usual is required annually till 2060 to shift the entire economy to a net zero pathway. However, there is, a, there is currently a dramatic mismatch in energy investments while representing just 15% of the world's population, high-income countries received 40% of global energy investments in uh, 2019. Conversely, 
Developing countries with 40% of the world's population receive just 15% of global energy investment, and that hasn't improved much uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in recent years. Energy consumption in developing countries has doubled in the last 15 years and is expected to grow another 30% in the next 15 years. Making capital available to fulfill the growing energy demand in these regions through renewables is central to reaching the goal of the Paris Agreements. All of our na national determined contributions under the Paris Agreements require an unprecedented scale of investments to flow into the African continent. An energy mix compatible with a 1.50 uh, uh, Celsius pathway would require 40 billion US dollars to flow into Sub-Saharan Africa annually, a fourfold increase compared to the 10 billion US dollars invested uh, since 2018. Further, the energy access element of the, of the transition must be linked with the emissions reductions aspect of the energy transition. For too long, we've considered these two as parallel tracks. If energy access issues are left unaddressed, we'll continue to see growing energy demand being addressed with high polluting and deforesting fuels such as diesel, kerosene, and firewood. As a result, efforts aimed at advancing climate goals must first and foremost create carbon space for growing economies that have historically made neg negligible contributions to global emissions and have an obligation to their people to provide access to energy for electricity, for cooking, and productive uses. The, the ultimate goal of the global energy transition should be to achieve reliable net zero carbon energy systems to power prosperous, inclusive economies. In the Nigerian context, that means building sustainability into our economic planning. We have developed an economic, we developed an economic sustainability plan in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, which included an ambitious plan over the near term to provide 5 million homes and SMEs with cleaner energy through our decentralized solar power program. This meant that 25 million Nigerians would have access to solar power. The first phase of this plan is already underway, and we think that this sort of program will very quickly ramp up progress towards net zero emissions. But to ramp up action, we have presented evidence that shows that gas is critical to integrating a greater share of renewable energy in Nigeria's energy mix. Limited grid systems generally have trouble integrating in intermittent sources above 15% of generation. However, those in, uh, intermittent renewables can increase to over 30% of generation when enabled by a similar share of natural gas. In order to drive the uh, energy transition at scale, we need to take a comprehensive approach. We have to work jointly towards common goals, including the market and environmental opportunities presented by the financing of clean energy assets in growing energy markets. To this end, in addition to conventional capital flows from public and private sources, it's essential that Africa can participate more fully in the global uh, carbon finance market. Currently, direct carbon pricing systems through carbon taxes have largely been concentrated in high and middle income countries. But carbon markets can play a very significant role in catalyzing sustainable energy deployment by directing private capital into climate action and improving global energy security, providing diversified incentive structures, especially in developing countries, and providing an impetus for clean energy markets when the price economics looks less compelling, as is the case today. So supporting Africa to develop into a global supplier of carbon credits ranging from biodiversity to energy-based credits, will be a leap forward in aligning uh, carbon pricing and related policy around a just uh, transition. I, th also, I also think that it's becoming quite evident that a just transition is key, not only to ensuring equity in climate policy, but also in building market structures that incentivize climate action, such as well-functioning carbon markets. Given the escalating debt, and you know, I think uh, th this might also be 
a point to consider, especially when we look at the escalating debt situations of many uh, developing countries, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic and the Russian-Ukrainian uh, crisis. I think we should also bring debt for climate swaps into the climate finance mix. Now, debt for climate swaps, are, as uh, many might know, are a type of debt swap where bilateral or multilateral debt is forgiven by creditors <coughs> in exchange for a commitment by the debtor to use outstanding debt service payments for national climate action programs. So typically, the creditor country or institution agrees to forgive a part of the debt if the debtor country would pay the uh, avoided debt service payment into a local currency, transparent local currency account, or an exco, or any other kind of transparent fund. And the funds must then be used for agreed climate projects in the debtor country. So we can actually increase the fiscal space for climate-related investments and reduce the debt burden for participating developing countries. There are, of course, you know, uh, very significant policy actions that will be necessary to make this, uh, to make uh, DFCs or uh, uh, these sort of swaps more acceptable and sustainable. But I think that the, the, the important thing is that it's a win-win uh, because obviously it contributes to the NDCs of the creditor country and it creates the fiscal space necessary for climate investments for the uh, debtor countries. So let me conclude by um, commending again the Global Institute uh, for the excellent work that you do on such a wide variety of important development issues, but in particular uh, for the opportunity to uh, share uh, some of these thoughts with you and also for encouraging uh, different narratives, especially from uh, the developing world here. So I must thank you again. Thank you very much all for listening. Thank you. <laughs>